Better make it quick because they're probably going to come up here. This is also in honor of Gabriella Miller, age 10, who just died a few weeks ago in October. She had brain cancer. Ten-year-olds are not supposed to get brain cancer. My sister and I both had severely disabled children. We lived in the um, Hoffman Estates near the Chicago Piles in 63 to 65, bloody noses every day from three to five years of age. We had handicapped children. People are dying. Kevin Blanche calls it the Pacific Genocide, and that's what's happening. But it's not just the Pacific that's dying. Radiation is killing this world. Your children and your genomes are over. We can stop this. Fukushima is the most terrifying situation I can imagine. You ask, what can we do? First of all, you have got to get a government that is in total collusion with TEPCO, the energy, energy company. They're lying through their teeth. Sailors say explosions like this made them sick when radioactive plumes settled on board the USS Ronald Reagan off the coast of Japan. And their attorney, Paul Garner, wants the country to pay up. They have physical problems. One of them is bleeding from his rectum uh, already. The others have problems with uh, thyroid glands. And Garner says another sailor now has cancer and recently had a baby with birth defects. These are all traits associated with radiation poisoning. We're just joking around because at the time there's still rumors going around about radiation being on the ship. And uh, we we're joking around about my like, growing extra fingers and toes and stuff like that. And we were like, let's uh, stop and get checked for radiation because they started setting up these little checkpoints all along the ship. And they're saying it's just a precaution and you don't have nothing to worry about. I mean, this thing has been pushed into the Pacific from day one for 958 days. And it doesn't matter if it's in the Pacific or it's in the air. It doesn't matter. You know, the marine layer rolls into California. The mysterious die-off of West Coast sea stars is spreading. The so-called melting sea stars were first noticed in Vancouver, then in Seattle, and now in California. Took them out as a precaution. Uh, there is a huge unknown as to why there is currently a die-off happening out in the wild. Few people would want to touch one of these. Sunflower sea stars infected with a strange melting disease, literally coming apart in the hands of biologists. The Seattle Aquarium sunflower sea stars are being held in isolated tanks away from the public. They're in quarantine. God bless you, Gabriella. It's been one month since her death. She was 10 years old. She died of a sudden onset of brain cancer for no apparent reason. 11 months after Fukushima. She is just one of the millions of children. Yes. Cancer, I've heard recently, is the number one reason for childhood death in America. That if, in fact, the fourth plant goes under an earthquake and those rods are exposed, it's bye-bye Japan and everybody on the west coast of North America should evacuate. Now, if that isn't terrifying, I don't know what is. Me, myself, I've had multiple, multiple miscarriages. I was completely infertile. I've watched the death of my babies year after year after year. My mother-in-law has cancer. My friend Jane Milliker has cancer. I, the, the list goes on and on. They put out the word, everything's fine, we got everything under control, and they lull everybody, the world, into a false sense of security. And I get my boots checked, uh, my pants, and then my hands. And as soon as they get to my hands, the machine just goes crazy. And instantly, like, we went from, like, smiling to... Uh, just being nervous and scared, and uh, they instantly told everybody to back away from me. They made a perimeter around me. You have seawater that they're using to cool it, because that adds to the creation of isotopes. A totally different isotopes that wouldn't have been released otherwise. I wish we knew what the real damage to the ocean was at this point. I think it would be so scary to I think about it every day. Yeah. <laughs>
At least three of the aquarium's captive sea stars were melting. Their tanks are filled with Puget Sound water. And the scene out there is worse. Aquarium divers found a much more serious situation in the wild population along the Seattle waterfront. The victims they brought up were in various stages of the disease. The estimates of infected sea stars has grown from 30 percent to 50 or 60 percent in just a few days. And now biologists in California are finding it too. Something is causing sea stars to be diseased um, along the coast at different locations. West Coast Aquariums have sent samples to several labs and are still awaiting results. An important species to the overall ocean health and one of their star attractions is at risk. In Seattle, Gary Chittum, King 5 News. Seattle Aquarium scientists say if they can identify the problem, they may be able to treat sea stars in their exhibits. But there's not much they can do for the sea stars in the wild. At this point, my mother had six miscarriages. Teenagers are dying of heart attacks all That's across right. the states. In California, I know five or six people who had stillborn babies in the last two years. These are people who they said, the doctor said the babies died because of stress. These are mothers who were in their early 20s. He said, we see the animals dying. We see things coming out of the ocean. People are feeling it. Everybody's tired. Sore throats, people's hair are falling out. There are things that we could be doing. Our thyroids are being completely blown away. We've got nodules. My best friend in California, Gary, 27 years old, has got a thyroid nodule that just cropped up in the last year. Why? I'll tell you why. Fukushima. Fukushima! The next miracle is nuclear energy. The thing I'm investing in, uh, and not because I expect to make a ton of money on it, uh, it's because it, I think, because it's zero CO2, because the economics are so good, uh, is a fourth generation design. And there are many fourth generation designs. This one is very, very attractive. Uh, by 2022, if everything goes perfectly, our demo reactor will be in place. And by <laughs> 2028, again, assuming everything continues to go perfectly, it will be a design that could be replicated and built in many, many, many uh, places. You could build hunt at that point because you have no fuel constraint. And according to me, you have extremely good economics, good safety, no proliferation, no waste. Uh, then if, you could you could go if, you could go nuts if everything goes perfectly. Absolutely. How often does everything go perfectly in nuclear? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> if you ignore no, no, come on. If you ignore 1979 and 1986 and 2011, come on, we've had a good century. <laughs> so the idea of full passive safety, Gen 3 takes us to much, much, much better passive safety, not full passive safety. Gen 4, whoever's Gen 4 gets built, will be a no human required, you know, no zirconium turning into hydrogen to explode type design. Great change is afoot in our world, albeit a change as terrifying as it is invisible. Many have succumbed and died already in this invisible war. Many more will continue to die unless we change direction. What we do from here will determine whether the death toll claims enough lives to end life on Earth, or permit enough life to survive to avoid extinction. As it is, the survivors will already have to share a planet alongside a host of newly released and pervasive radiological terrors. It is four years since the Olympics were scheduled to be held in Tokyo, which in the end never took place. For the world is an inhospitable place now, its life-giving biosphere destroyed by irrevocable man-made climate change. Not due to carbon dioxide and not due to heat waves and firestorms, but sub-zero freezing temperatures and almost complete darkness, 
with an atmosphere filled with carbon-14. Nuclear winter and radionuclear contamination born of both catastrophic and colossal nuclear accidents and thermonuclear conflict have affected a dystopic climate change often alluded to in science fiction imaginings. How did humanity arrive and end here? It was in sunlit waters like these that life on Earth began. In time it would migrate to the land. These organisms know nothing of human activity above them that their forebears helped to spawn. But soon they probably will, to their detriment. In a kind of cruel and ungrateful payback to the debt we owe these waters and the oceans for our human existence, in a betrayal of our human origins and biological ancestry, life on Earth may so very easily be ended from dimly lit man-made pools of water like this one, a stone's throw away from the ocean where it began. The town of Pripyat sits three kilometers from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Reactor 4 melts down on April 26, 1986, releasing significant radiation across eastern and northern Europe. After some considerable initial denial, the Soviet authorities mobilize. Local residents are evacuated. 500,000 reservists, miners and specialists descend upon Chernobyl. They clean up and dispose of radioactive debris liquidating the area, even shooting down irradiated animals. Most importantly, they excavate beneath the melting reactor core so as to extract deposited water from its basement and then fill it with concrete. This water extraction avoids a high-pressure second explosion that would have rendered much of Europe uninhabitable. The basement concrete will be the foundation of the sarcophagus. For several months, this special task force fights day after day with meager, improvised protective clothing and equipment so that the reactor core that has morphed into an unyielding corium lava does not reach the aquifer below, contaminating the Pripyat River, then the Dnieper, and on to the Black Sea. Despite this victory, a Russian research paper will be finally published in the New York Academy of Sciences in 2010, citing the combined Chernobyl death toll to be one million persons worldwide. A tragic yet unsurprising figure as the fallout from Chernobyl was a hundred times greater than the fallout from the combined atomic detonations at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This does not account for the thousands of miscarriages and genetic diseases that have afflicted countless Eastern European children since. Many of the liquidators have died or are dying as a result of their efforts. This story was only told in detail in the documentary The Battle of Chernobyl 20 years later. A few thousand kilometers from warm Hawaiian waters steams a U.S. Navy Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. It projects American power and prestige in international waters and is a key player in the contemporary war on terrorism. Such a vessel and its battle group can lay waste to any good-sized nation-state in minutes. Now it has just received word that a terrible disaster has befallen its ally nation of Japan. The ship, along with its support vessels, steamed towards North Japan to render assistance. Yet, the USS Ronald Reagan will fail disastrously in its mission to mitigate the suffering of the people of Japan, and also in its primary mission of defending the United States' homeland against terrorist enemies. It never even stood a chance. For all its military might, its 100,000-ton displacement, bristling high-tech weapons and highly trained personnel, 
The Reagan and its task force was unknowingly fighting a battle it did not comprehend, was ill-equipped for, and moreover was never mandated to seriously engage. It was pitted against an insurmountable enemy. It was up against the four. Four exploded nuclear reactor buildings with a radioactive arsenal the equivalent of 14,000 Hiroshima bombs. Before 311, they were used for power generation for Japanese civilians, but now in an instant converted Godzilla-like into a massive and invulnerable nuclear artillery battery pummeling the whole Pacific Ocean. Its invisible, destructive venom is not carried by shells and gunpowder, but the airstream, water currents, and infected microbes and complex multicellular organisms. Many of its salvos explode continually for thousands of years, not making craters, but destroying DNA over half-lives as long as 24,000 years. Against such an enemy, the task force turned tail and beat an ignominious retreat. At Fukushima Daiichi, the northern Japan earthquake and tsunami causes not only the explosion and meltdown, but the full China syndrome of three larger nuclear reactor cores at reactors 1, 2 and 3. A terrific explosion at reactor 4 severely destabilizes the building that in itself houses 10 Chernobyl's worth of potential fallout in a storage pool stacked 100 feet in the air. The USS Ronald Reagan had no idea there was a nuclear accident at Fukushima when it embarked upon Operation Tomodachi. The Daiichi plant operator TEPCO, the Japanese government and the US military when faced with a nuclear disaster many more times grave and deadly than Chernobyl. Instead of mobilizing its resources and manpower to engage this even more formidable enemy than was present at Chernobyl 25 years earlier, chose not to respond and let the radioactive chips fall where they may. Instead of mirroring the great martial Soviet effort at Chernobyl that saved Mother Russia and in turn the whole of Europe, these fabled warriors against terrorism are stood down. They do not and have not yet begun the battle of Fukushima. Instead of battle, there is colossal betrayal. This betrayal at Fukushima will kill millions sooner or later. Even if the battle were to begun now, tremendous damage to our planet has been done and millions are slated to suffer egregiously. We can only guess and estimate because governments are doing all they can to obscure what is happening in the waters and the air near Fukushima. Where one failed at Chernobyl in 1986, three have succeeded stunningly at Fukushima. Three nuclear reactor cores have not merely penetrated through their reactor and concrete containment, but have reached the aquifer below that flows into the Pacific Ocean. These lava flows are similar to what the melted reactor cores look like, but in no way as toxic. Unlike conventional lava, Corium lava remains hot for much, much longer. 
and more to the point are highly radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. This German marine research lab model released after the accident shows a single oceanic radiation release that contaminates the whole of the Pacific Ocean that reaches North America in several years. In truth, however, endless waves of these releases one after the other would be more accurate. Having mixed with the now subterranean reactor cores, 400 tons of radioactive contaminated water has been flowing into the Pacific every day for the past two and a half years, having only been recently confirmed by the New York Times. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jamie Plim. Um, uh, we're about to pull into a routine port call in South Korea, um, and we found out that the tsunami and earthquake happened. Immediately we knew that we were going to uh, reroute the ship to Japan to provide aid and, um, you know, give them food, water. Um, so we did that immediately. We probably got to the coast of Japan by the day after it happened. We never heard anything about a nuclear power plant. We never knew about the possibility, let alone any kind of leak. Um, so we were there outside. Our job as quartermasters um, is not only navigating the ship, driving, plotting our course and track, but going outside at the top of the ship to raise flags um, to communicate with our ships. Um, so being outside, we were breathing in this radiation. We were handling flags, which are porous, very porous material, obviously. We didn't really hear anything for probably a couple weeks after about um, a leak in the uh, power plants. Um, and even then, it was just still considered kind of a rumor. We the ship didn't really even go on lockdown, which I mean by that, like no one was allowed outside um, probably until about a month and a half after um, the initial, the, the 11th, March 11th. So um, we were outside breathing this in, handling stuff, handling materials and just absorbing the radiation. About halfway through, probably around the summertime, my menstrual cycle just disappeared completely. And then it would come back and disappear and go on and off. And this happened until about the summer of 2012, where it came back in such full force that um, I was in and out of the emergency room. Um, once they thought they were going to have to do a blood transfusion on me because I had lost so much. In addition to that, in February 2012, I developed bronchitis um, and then from February to the summer of 2012, I got it six times. I was sent to a respiratory doctor and it was determined that I developed asthma. So a lot of people um, don't understand that once you get out of the Navy, you don't get any health care at all. Um, if you retire and you stay in 20 years, you get health care. This is also what we're involved in the lawsuit against TEPCO um, for, for medical expenses that we're now having to, we're going to have to pay out of pocket for. Uh, we also fly our American flag or ensign at the highest point so people know where the U.S. Navy. I was uh, told by one of the higher ups to go out and retrieve the American flag so we can give it to the Japanese as a, as a, as a friendship type of deal, like a gift. Uh, I pulled the flag down, it's flapping the wind and wrapped around me, it got all over me. Uh, I folded it up, took it down there, I gave it to them and I'm not sure what they did with it, but I got off watch an hour later. And we make it to the decon station, and I see there's a huge pile of clothes there from other sailors. And I go in, and they had to remove three layers of skin off my hands and my arms. They called and asked me to come up on watch to relieve the people on watch, and they told me that I had received the highest amount of radiation out of anybody on the ship. Uh, like two months after, uh, lump appeared on my jaw and uh, I went and got that looked at by the Navy Medical and they told me that there was uh, nothing they could do about it while we're out to see that we'd have to wait for us to pull in and uh, another lump appeared between my eyes uh, I have another lump on my right thigh as soon as I got out of the military I went uh, back to college and I started playing college sports again and slowly after that, my body just started to fall apart. It's harder for me to breathe now. It feels a lot like my lungs are too big for my, my body whenever I do something like strenuous. Uh, 
I lost a lot of weight from uh, the time I was in the Navy until now. I got stomach ulcers. It doesn't look like it, but my, my hair started to fall out. I try to avoid brushing and combing it. Like a little bit after we found out that the ship was radiated and we had finished up helping out, we left the area. And before we pulled into our first port since the disaster, we all had to sign this paperwork saying that the military is not to be held liable for for uh, anything that happened. And we had to sign paperwork saying that we weren't sick, that we were okay, and that they did test on us. And it, it wasn't like a yes or no type of option. It was just like you have to sign it. Mutations are regularly reported in Japan and North America, moreover, as the Pacific jet stream and precipitation carries it eastward and ingloriously dumps it onto the new world. 1,300 fuel rods are sitting in a pool 100 feet above the ground in the weakened building, the Reactor 4 building. If a mishap during this fabled fuel removal that some independent observers rightly doubt is taking place at all, causes an explosion, it would likely result in the abandonment of Daiichi, the free release of radioactive water on top of that existing, and the meltdown of all the spent fuel stored at the site, making the release scenario an 85 times Chernobyl event. In truth, what is happening at Reactor 4 is unclear and likely fraught with its own deception within the greater cover-up of the whole Fukushima radiation crisis. The possible scenarios are either that the fuel pool has already burned into the Pacific jet stream and ocean, or are at best largely still sitting in a pool of water, but the evidence leans closer to the former scenario. Equally stunning and far-reaching as this disaster is the astounding silence and myopia not merely by governments and the pliant media, but also the overwhelming majority of academia, public figures, health advocates, and NGOs, even fabled environmental groups. I thought for sure after day 100, day 200, somebody would break ranks at Berkeley or Stanford or Oregon State or Washington. We'd get a study come out of the Pacific Ocean showing plutonium in the plankton and the whole world would go in crazy and that would be the end of nuclear. I really thought that's how it could play out. And here we are, what, 956 days later? Mm -hmm. Not one single study freaking out of any of these 300 marine biologists, park sheets, and not one saying yay or nay. Now, who would ever believe that is possible? Yet people are still waiting for confirmation from BBC, Reuters, CNN, you know, mm -hmm. they're still waiting. I thought Greenpeace would be all over this after 311. I mean, you look at their website and you look at you click on oceans, and there's there's nothing there about Fukushima at all. Pacific Ocean. Look at this, Andrew. When I was in San Diego this summer, yeah. I had it out with a young activist on Pacific Beach Pier, and I had him call what's his name, the head of Greenpeace. He lives up in the trestle, and I and he came down, and I'm like, where are you guys? Where are you guys? And, you know, you're using scratch. They're nothing but they, they've evolved to the Sierra Club Greenpeace. They are nothing but cash cows for these people to talk. They watch the same way as everything. You've got to see the house that they lived in. Same with the guy they had at the Sierra Club. They turned into fundraising organizations. So they have to, he told me, here's exactly what he told me. He says, Kevin, we have a flyer that goes out to our website once a week. And we rank the top 10 issues that people want us to address. And Fukushima hasn't made the top 10 yet. And I says, so you're about fundraising. You're not about leading. You're not about taking on telling them what the most important issue. You're letting them tell them. So you're all about fundraising. Yeah, and that's they're what diversifying. they are. They're diversifying. They're diversifying so they can increase their funding. I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even give them that much uh, uh, of an excuse. I would say they're gatekeepers. The people that had these organizations up get corrupted and become gatekeepers. They they hold the they hold the truth in and turn it and twist it to suit their own pocketbook. Behind right. any of these groups too. I mean if you notice like the, the people who are are being the loudest, who are putting out the most information are the ones that aren't getting paid to do any of this. You know, exactly. they're, they're doing it out of, you know, using their own fund their own funds, you know, digging uh 
um, you know, in, into their own pockets to, to try to fund themselves and, and stay away from that because, it, you know, you don't even want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. it, it always, uh, you know, then you have people that want to tell you what to talk about and what to say. And uh, so it is any any organization that receives any kind of funding, and that includes activists, are probably the last people that I get information from. And how can anyone, anyone believe that this thing isn't the greatest ecological disaster in the history of humanity? A mere handful of independent scientists and health experts have spoken out about the true nature of the disaster. Nuclear engineer Arnie Gundersen, physician Dr. Helen Caldicott, and chemical scientist and advisor to the EU on radiation Dr. Chris Busby have fought for the dangers of the ionizing radiation to be known to the general public. Dr. Lauren Murray has also notably pointed out the distinct possibility of the 311 earthquake being man-made, such is the technology available to those who may have reason to use it. Also tremendous to the minute reporting on the Fukushima disaster was done not by the media and luminous organizations like the UN or Greenpeace, but by a motley crew of individuals. Kevin Blanche, a long-time anti-nuclear activist and analyst, declared publicly that the three reactor cores were most likely in full meltdown several days after March 11, 2011. Christina Consolo runs the site FukushimaFacts.com that is an online omnibus of radiation and disaster information that assists the public on how to mitigate the effects of radioactive fallout. Tony Muga is a musician turned author journalist who broke the story of the Nuclear Regulatory Council's internal documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. These documents detail the ongoing data findings and private but alarmed conversations between officials at the NRC as the radioactive plume hit North America a few days after March 11. Iori Machizuki is a Japanese self-described cyber dissident who writes on his site FukushimaDiary.com that provides detailed scientific and anecdotal news reporting of the effects of the disaster. All these persons prior to 311 living relatively normal lives, now thrust and self-conscripted in a struggle to generate public recognition that the Battle of Fukushima must be started. Slowly their reports are prying open the eyes of the world public about Fukushima, yet many times faster and widespread than the TV adult public are the radionuclides that are literally running circles around them and the globe and the relatively tiny Fukushima truth movement. But not only is the eastbound radiation relentless and indefatigable, but so are the financial resources, master strategies and lobbying power of the nuclear lobby. With Germany renouncing and France withdrawing from nuclear power, the response of the nuclear lobby has been to double and triple down vigorously. Demonstrative of its power is its ability through government proxies to switch off radiation detectors across the United States and raise the acceptable radiation doses in Japan and America. It has coerced the Japanese government to burn radioactive waste across Japan and create laws against whistleblowing. Now it seeks nuclear plants elsewhere as the psychological fallout from Fukushima seemingly died down a few months after 311. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and the Turkish government in October 2013 signed an agreement with a consortium led by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries to build four nuclear reactors in the Black Sea city of Sino at an estimated cost of more than 22 billion. Abe seeks new contracts with Vietnam, Russia and India. A new nuclear plant in Hinkley Point in Britain that will go online in 2023 has also been given the go-ahead. I'm Robert Stone. I'm the producer and director of the film. Most documentaries function and are marketed and have a life out in the world by reinforcing people's preconceptions about the world. What we've done here with this movie is to take a different tack. It's, and it's not like coming at you in your face and saying, oh, you're wrong, 
this is why you're wrong. It's we are you, and we were wrong about some things, and we were wrong n for a whole variety of reasons because we were given information that was wrong. This documentary financed by Microsoft co-founder, billionaire Paul Allen and Richard Branson is a glossy and desperate pitch to put the eco-friendly in nuclear in light of Fukushima. Pandora's promise, referring to the artifact, a box or more accurately a jar, given to Pandora in Greek mythology by Zeus, which she out of curiosity opens and in turn releases all the evils in the world promises that the fast breeder reactor technology cancelled in 1994 was always the answer we have been looking for, especially in times of fancy climate change. Thus, nuclear technology, which was traditionally misunderstood as evil, could represent the hope that Pandora found at the bottom of the jar or box, after inadvertently releasing the evil. Man-made climate change, born of carbon dioxide emissions, is the powerful gravitational draw card, the beacon to which much of the green movement's political, financial, and emotional capital has been fastened. Pandora's promise thus attempts to draw as much of the climate change movement away from anti-nuclear sentiments and inhibitions and have them embrace this supposedly carbon-free, non-polluting nuclear technology. How the movie seeks to prize green support away from anti-nuclear is the PRISM, a fast breeder technology, the research of which is funded by Microsoft's Bill Gates, who is himself heavily invested in depleted uranium, and designed and constructed by GE Hitachi, whose reactor technology is currently melting down into the Pacific Ocean and into the Pacific jet stream. The fourth generation nuclear reactor, the fast breeder reactor, creates more plutonium waste than older designs and if it were embraced today by first, second and third world countries to meet their pressing energy needs, it would inevitably exacerbate nuclear weapons proliferation. Were it not used for more nuclear weapons, the plutonium waste has to be stored still after civilian use and requires the same land space and resources for it to be stored as conventional plutonium. Notwithstanding these significant gaffes, the film Pandora's Promise makes an appeal that makes no sense. It makes the case for new nuclear technology that is better and safer than previous reactor designs, requiring billions more in research and development dollars from taxpayers that are, according to the film, already amazingly safe. The breeder, I told you the Finnish reactor is costing $11 billion a gigawatt. This technology is one and a half to two times as expensive as that, okay? Breeder technology is much more expensive. It's also less reliable. It also has, uh, it, it has a, it, it, it's sodium cooled. Sodium is reactive, both violently reactive, both to water and to air. We know what it does and we know that when they built them, it was a waste of money that the one that they built the super phoenix which is the most famous one that they built in france uh gave seven percent of the energy that it was expected to and had to close after 15 years the manju plant that they built in japan which was the flagship of this kind of technology had a fire in it and it had to close down the Calcar plant, which was the flagship of the German breeder reactor effort. Bobby. They never Bobby, put plutonium in it. Come on, and come it on, come used, on. This is, is bad. It's used as a, an amusement park, and it is the only one of these plants to ever make money. This is like the people who say that Solyndria went bankrupt, and therefore we shouldn't build any more solar plants anymore. Uh, that, I mean, it's all just... All of them closed it's down, Robert. Every one of them closed down because they were unreliable, and they were dangerous. The IFR ran perfectly. Hideously expensive. The IFR ran well, perfectly you, for 30 years. Let, let me tell perfectly. you... Perfectly. Let me tell you the real reason. Yeah, half of them operated okay half of them okay, well that's pretty good for an experimental thing so let's well, what's the problem with like moving forward Listen. the film and its director robert stone uphold the world health organization line that no one died due to three mile island and fukushima and that a mere 56 people to date have died due to chernobyl bee stings kill 58 americans every year and that is generally deemed to be acceptable 
if we take the United Nations and the World Health Organization at their word, who are tied at the hip with the very pro-nuclear IAEA, then current nuclear plants by this measure have an absolutely outstanding safety record and must be embraced immediately. No need for fast breeders and documentaries about them. The movie thus has a plot that has no direction to go to and no compelling void to fill. The film farcically tries to create a nuclear industry year zero, creating an Orwellian memory hole into which the whole catalogue of dreadful cancer deaths and contamination and deadliest of all, the litany of lies that have come out of the nuclear industry pertaining to its economic viability, its direct link to the weapons industry, the non-observance of even basic safety standards and lack of oversight of plant maintenance and nuclear plants to date, and the millions of deaths emanating from nuclear weapons and nuclear power fallout. All this is to be expunged from record, dumped into a repository and buried forever. The film runs on an alternative timeline from that of actual history and nuclear mortality rates. Of course, the deadly legacy of nuclear power must be obscured, otherwise the whole industry might be killed off. A hitherto unprecedented and much belated study published in the New York Academy of Sciences in 2010 that laid out the figure of 1 million Chernobyl deaths from the 1986 accident has been fiercely attacked by nuclear-sponsored academia. But if we go to the Pripyat region and actually investigate, we would find thousands of children and young adults with deformities and birth and heart defects, not to mention those who have died already. You have to look at the, the worst case scenarios that have happened with even the most ridiculously designed reactor ever built, which is the one at Chernobyl. Um, the worst case scenario turns out to be not the apocalypse that we all thought it was. The, the, I trust the United Nations and the World Health Organization that's done the definitive studies on this, and their conclusion is that Chernobyl has killed 56 people, which was probably the most astonishing fact I came across in making the whole film. Of the 500,000 Chernobyl liquidators, the Russian military disclosed that 20,000 have died as of 2006, and 200,000 are permanently disabled. This is the price they paid, so that the whole of Europe remained habitable, and all of the Soviet Union's water supply from the Dnieper and the Black Sea remained drinkable. The reality is that Chernobyl has killed, and continues to kill many, many more than the World Health Organization presents. And if it were acknowledged to do so, it would undermine very powerful nuclear interests and corporations. The price was not solely paid by liquidators. Eastern European nations like Poland, Bulgaria, Estonia, Finland, and Russia itself have their own national cover-ups of their respective cancer and leukemia figures resulting from Chernobyl. The cases of illness and death are vastly underreported or obscured especially after the Chernobyl dwarfing disaster at Fukushima. That is why the Reagan and any US help had to be turned away from Fukushima. That is why the Fukushima area and Greater Tokyo are not evacuated, despite the recommendation of the head of Japan's Atomic Energy Commission. And much of Japan is subject to nuclear waste incineration. That is why there is no alarm sounded as the radioactive plume both seaborne and airborne hits North America and moves on to circle the globe. The power of the nuclear weapons and nuclear power industry is that vast and dominating. Stone stated in a recent interview promoting his movie that his 1988 anti-nuclear documentary, Radio Bikini, was a little misconceived in that it lumped nuclear weapons and nuclear power into the same box. Stone posits that it was nuclear weapons that destroyed Bikini's environment and caused returned inhabitants to become sick and die. Nuclear power kills just as effectively as nuclear weapons, and to even draw a distinction between them is an exercise as ridiculous as it is dangerous. In 1951, a study by the US Atomic Energy Commission concluded that nuclear power generation was economically untenable as it did not generate enough profit to be viable. So fraught with risks are nuclear plants, 
that a special act of Congress was made to exempt the nuclear industry from having to gain insurance for their operations to pay out potential victims and homeowners, the price Anderson Act. Wall Street firms wanted nothing to do with the insuring of the plants. The plants' construction and maintenance themselves are completely subsidized by the taxpayer. All this was overcome by the Atomic Energy Act in 1954, passed by Congress that determined that nuclear power plants should be made economically feasible by having them sell the plutonium they generate to nuclear weapons manufacturers. Thus, it is no exaggeration for long-time anti-nuclear advocate Helen Caldicott to famously quip that every nuclear power plant is a bomb factory. The nuclear power industry is the nuclear weapons industry, which is GE, Westinghouse, Hitachi, Monsanto, all of whom are players in the military industrial complex. As nuclear power and possibly new generation 4 reactors and nuclear weapons become more sought after by countries like India, Pakistan, Israel, Iran and North Korea, it creates a relentless positive feedback loop for plutonium generation and thus nuclear weapons proliferation as they are constantly jockeying for power and influence and in turn more deterrence from their rivals and neighbors. The very public fear of weapons of mass destruction stoked vociferously after the US government attacked its own people on 9-11 and blamed a personal friend of the Bush family who has already confirmed to be dead or on his deathbed can now be used to legitimate US attacks and aggression on nation states that the military industrial complex finds uncooperative as the reins of the US government and the military industrial complex have been held by the international banking cartel.